talk about one of my favorite topics. I'm a senior citizen. My name is Ann Caulfield. I'm a veterinarian at Phoenix Village Animal Hospital. Um, and what we're going to do is just talk a little bit about this. was my little temple who was a rescue from a pretty um, horrible puppy mill. She had two broken front legs that they never fixed. And so she kind of walked like this until it got them fixed. And she was a she was a feisty little thing, but she, she was a sweet one. So what we're going to do is talk about uh, older pets and the role they play in our lives and what sort of things we can do to help them out as we face some of these changes that happen in our lives. And it is that changing status of pets in our lives where we, we like to say they've gone from the backyard to the bedroom in a relatively short period of time and they become a really integral part of our lives. That was the client gave me that picture there. The Rottweiler in Philadelphia. That's kind of neat. So it's it's this changing status in our lives that's really driving these advancements in veterinary care that are allowing these pets to live the lifespans they are. Better nutrition, we're understanding more and more. We're not there yet. We don't know everything. It's like the human nutrition, um, preventive medical care. Doing screening, you're getting some early screening tests done, you know, just physical exams, um, and more advanced diagnostics and treatments that are allowing uh, very commonly cats to be 16, 17, 18. Not unusual to see them 20 these days. And uh, our dogs, little guys, you know, have the same thing 16, 17. Uh, so they're living longer, definitely, and they're generally healthier. But as they age, there are some challenges that uh, that can be posed with their health care, keeping them happy and comfortable. So what I'd like to talk about today, can everybody hear me okay? Is, you know, just a little bit, what is, everybody wants to know what's the lifespan? You come in with a new dog, they dog, and what's the lifespan? How long are they going to live? So, you know, what is that lifespan? What are we talking about? And who is a senior pet? When, when do we consider? There's no hard, hard definition of that, but in general we have some guidelines. We'll talk a little bit about what the aging process is and isn't. Um, and then we'll hone in a little bit on some of the more specific health concerns that we probably see more commonly in our pets. And then finally, as they get near the end, um, some quality of life assessments. It's really, really difficult and it's really stressful, you know, when you see them struggling to know, you know when is when is it time to kind of let them peacefully go. So there are some, some ways that we can try to look at that and assess that. So back to that lifespan. So it depends a little bit on a few things. What species you are. So lifespan of a little mouse, much, much different than a lifespan of this parrot. So you're looking at maybe, probably at most a, a year, probably months for a little wild mouse. Um, probably upwards of 60, 70, 80 years for a big parrot like that. So you definitely need to make plans if you get a parrot. <laughs> um, also the breed, so even you know, with the, our domestic dogs, our little chihuahua friend here, you know, wouldn't be a, a unrealistic to think of that chihuahua you know, having a lifespan of, of probably 16 or 17, but our big guy over here, we're probably looking at more like, fortunately, seven, six, seven, eight, you know, so it really depends on the size. Acquired diseases this is a big one. So weight gain, um, you know, poor nutrition, uh, arthritis, these things that kind of come along, sometimes even starting in early life, that can influence how long the dogs and cats are going to live. Environmental stressors. So you can imagine these feral cats that are kind of dependent on people feeding them, disease amongst them, fighting, um, their lifespan, just getting predation, getting hit by cars, they're not going to live as long as our cats that live inside nice and comfortably. American Animal Hospital Association suggests, you know, what, when are our pets considered senior? Um, and there's several definitions, but in general, when we, we consider them seniors when they've lived about 75% of their expected lifespan. For small breeds, that's going to be you know, 11 years or older. For these medium to large breeds, like your Labradors, uh, 
uh, maybe nine to ten years, and then for the giant breeds, like you say, those those guys, you're looking at six or seven, you know, considered senior pets or geriatric. Cats are a little bit more uniform. We don't see the the big size variations that we do in all the dog breeds. So generally, we'll start to see age-related changes, subtle things at about seven to ten years of age in our cats. Um, we consider them seniors anywhere from 11 to 14, and then 15 and on up, uh, we're considering the more geriatrics. And this is a really important point I want to get across as I get older. <laughs> um, the aging process is not a disease. And I do hear this a lot that, you know, a dog will come in and it's stiff or it's one thing, and people say, oh, it's just, they're just getting older, they're just getting older. Um, you know, but the poor health is not synonymous with aging. And it, we do see, and we'll talk about this, obviously more disease processes happening as pets get older, but um, if, you know, in us and in them, you know, we should not just assume that you know, age is, is a disease process or they should be unhealthy when they're older. But aging is associated with this gradual kind of deterioration and in interrelationships among a lot of the body systems, and we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in our pets. Um, so acquired diseases like cancers, and a reduced ability to really cope with physiological stresses um, and environmental stresses. So here we go again with our older cats living outside, or people will have to, you know, fortunately I don't see it as much uh, anymore, but you know, having your old dog living in the backyard in a dog house, you're not gonna be able to cope with that as well. It's very rare to see a geriatric pet come in with one single problem. Um, so what we call comorbid morbidities or, or multiple disease processes going on in multiple organ systems. So again, that degeneration and the, with, and the interrelationship of how these organ systems are playing together as things sort of uh, degenerate a little bit. So you get various levels of dysfunction depending on which systems are involved. <clears throat> Aging is genetically programmed, or it really adheres to be, um, but there's so much, and this is true for ourselves, there's so much that we can do that can influence the, the uh, aging process in our pets. So nutrition is a big one, exercise and fitness, and then trying to manage and, and prevent, if we can or at least manage acquired diseases that come along. And our best way that we have of managing those types of diseases that we'll talk about is picking them up early. And it's really true in cats. Cats are just champions of hiding disease. They, they don't let us know they're sick until they're really sick. So one of the first things that we start to see in cats is their weight. They'll start to lose a little bit of weight. And it's really tough to pick up, you know, pet your cat or pick them up and say, oh, you've lost two ounces. But this is something that uh, we see every day. You know, day after the cat comes in, six months later, it's a half pound lighter, and that's a, that's a big concern, uh, unless we're actively trying to get it to lose weight. So really good, and they appear to get sick quickly, but it's been there, it's been smoldering until they hit that tipping point, and can't compensate anymore, and then it's like, wow, they just got sick so quickly. So picking up um, diseases, picking up problems early, will really help us manage them much better. And these are some of the systems, just briefly, that we see alterations in. So the, the endocrine system, um, all the glands, the thyroid gland in particular, uh, pituitary, the adrenals, things like Cushing's disease and hypothyroid disease or hypothyroid disease in dogs. In their digestive tract, as they get older, uh, they're not digesting fats and proteins maybe as well. A lot of oral cavity disease, a lot of dental disease in pets as they age. Um, the integumentary system or the skin, a lot of times they'll have this dry, kind of thin hair coat. Your skin has lost some, uh, some of its elasticity, so wounds and things like that can be more common, particularly if they're laying down a lot over pressure points like the hips and the elbows. Um, cardiac disease, we definitely do see some structural changes in, in hearts and sometimes the blood vessels, particularly the valves of the heart in certain breeds, and we'll talk about that. Um, urinary system kidney disease is a big one in cats as they get older, we'll talk about that. And then finally, um, I think finally, uh, musculoskeletal system. So arthritis is, a, is probably one of the most common um, 
diseases that we see uh, resulting in a lot of dysfunction, a lot of pain, um, and, and oftentimes leads to uh, euthanasia. Oh, so the, yeah, the nervous system is another one where we can see deafness really commonly. You know, the visual acuity starts to slip as they get older. Um, taste and smell. Smell tends to hang in there pretty, pretty long, but definitely vision and um, hearing loss is very common. That's another one with the hearing that people, you know, all of a sudden they just seem to get deaf, but it tends to be more progressive. Certain pitches, certain levels of sound sort of begin to drop out, that conversational level of, of noise they don't tend to hear as well. And it can be a problem, I, I can probably tell you about five or six dogs that people have run over in their own driveway because they're laying out there, they don't hear the car, they back over them, and it's, it's tragic and it's really sad, but it happens a lot. So you, know, you want to be protecting them from hurting themselves hurt. Um, and also, they're sound asleep, they don't hear you, you come by to pet them and it startles them. Sometimes they'll they'll nip or they'll snap. So you could you know stomp on the floor, or make some vibrations, maybe touch them with a pillow or something like that to wake them up. But it can. Uh, it happens to my own dog. He, he, he falls into a sleep boy. Um, I gotta kind of look at him, make sure he's still breathing. Um, metabolism. So in general, their metabolic rate can slow down. And they don't thermal regulate as well as they start to get older. So maybe skinny little cats and really get are often chilly, um, and they're not as active. So, so just starting, we'll kind of hit on a few of those those uh, specifics. So if we start with the digestive system, and we're going to talk mostly about uh, dental disease. This is not confined to older pets, but we tend to see it at its worst in the older pets. It really is preventable, or at least manageable. It is probably one of our most underdiagnosed sources of chronic pain in pets. Um, there's a huge bacterial load associated with all that plaque and the calculus that, that forms in the mouth, which causes chronic inflammation, uh, and possibly bacterial seeding from the mouth. And the bacteria doesn't just stay in the, in the mouth. There's a big blood supply there. So every time we're chewing, we get a shower of bacteria. Uh, but mostly what we worry about with it is the pain and that chronic inflammatory state that's created. Um, tooth loss, it, it affects how they apprehend or grab their food, how they chew, um, could lead to digestibility problems, and these teeth that, that are loose in there, when they bite down, it hurts. So it's very, very common, probably at least, maybe even more, 60% of senior pets do have pretty uh, significant dental disease. And this is not unusual, I mean, you see lots of gum recession. But this is just, this is pus coming out of the mm -hmm. teeth, that's hair, it's all mm -hmm. caked around those teeth. And you can just imagine how that smells when they come up to <laughs> when you give you a um, So, what, <clears throat> so dental cleanings are a really important part of preventive health care. I know it's a very common concern and a legit, legitimate one that, you know, they're so old, should we get these teeth done? We're really worried about anesthesia. And, and there is nobody that can tell you there's nothing to worry about with anesthesia. I don't care if that's us going under or these guys going under, but I will tell you that modern day veterinary anesthesia has gotten to be extremely safe. Um, we use the same anesthetic drugs that are used in people. We do everything we can before they're put under anesthesia to make sure that that's safe. These are usually gas anesthetics, so if they notice a problem while they're asleep, their heart rates drop, blood pressure drops, we can wake them right up. So age is not necessarily going to be a reason to avoid doing the teeth. And I, and I see this every day too, is like, well, the teeth are bad, but they're, they're 13 years old, we're not gonna do them. And they come back next year, they're 14 years old, the teeth are even that much worse. Mm -hmm. It just keeps going and going. Um, it, it really does get to a point where the health concerns associated with these bad teeth outweigh those anesthetic risks. Um, but as long as you know they're, they're monitored closely, they're a good surgical candidate. So we're dealing with all the potential disease proxies that might put them at higher risk um, 
under anesthesia. Uh, the, the other good thing about, you know, if we do more frequent cleanings or do home dental care, we'll talk about that, is, you know, if we do have to do the cleaning, then they're not going to be under as long. It's a, it's a quicker cleanup. You don't have to have them under for four, three, four hours pulling teeth and, and doing all that. So, um, talked about how do we make them a safer an anesthetic candidate, pre anesthetic blood work, um, we watch the blood pressures closely, they're on IV fluids. Uh, but home dental care, this is something that's really, really important. Cats too. Yeah, cats are tough, but it's still worth trying. Um, I always tell people I'd rather see you take five or six months, try to teach them to maybe tolerate having their teeth cared for at home, then trying to get a toothbrush and you rush, you, you rush in there and they're throwing their heads all around. It's really frustrating and it just won't get done often enough because you need to brush the teeth, ideally every day, but at least every other. If you're doing it less than every other, then we're not removing or at least minimizing that plaque layer uh, frequently enough to prevent the uh, bacteria from causing gingivitis and then that whole periodontal disease cascade and it takes it that long to start setting up into that hard calculus that you've probably seen in their mouths that you can't brush away. Um, but if you take your time, you know, when they're calm and relaxed, maybe just start massaging the outside of their, their faces a little bit. Cats tend to like when you rub them there because they have that little cheek gland, mm. just like that. They want to run away, look away, you let them go. Um, and it might take you six weeks to get them comfortable with that. And then the next step, you can get a pet toothpaste, which you don't technically need, but they're flavored so they like them. So you put a little dab on your fingertip and go under the lip and just do a quick little rub like that. Keep it where you keep their treats or their food. Get all excited when you bring it out so they, they sort of kind of look forward to it. And then eventually you can get maybe even just an old t-shirt or gauze or a green dish towel wrapped around your fingertip, moisten it, the paste. And now when you rub the gums and teeth with that, it's soft, but it's still a little abrasive, so it's going to help to break up that plaque layer. Um, and then, you know, eventually you can try toothbrush. I just recommend trying like the uh, smallest, softest kids' toothbrush that you can find. But it's the frequency, whether it's a cloth or the brush, it's going to make the difference. Um, and you won't brush off what's there, but it will help it from getting worse. Some animals are just not going to let you do it. You know? And if they can't, there's actually a website you can go to, it's called VOHC.org, and that stands for Veterinary Oral Health Council. And what that is is a group of uh, academic veterinary dentists, board certified clinical veterinary dentists that came together to test a lot of these dental care products that you can get. Because uh, there's a lot of bogus information about the claims of what they do and don't do. Um, and so they test these products independent of the company that makes them, and it's pretty rigorous. And if it passes their testing, it'll get this VOHC seal of approval. And they have a website, VOHC.org, that you can go to that lists all these products that have passed their testing. And some of them are, are um, water additives, some are foods, some are treats, you know, some are gels. So you might be able to find something if brushing doesn't work. Brushing's the best, but at least you know something that would fit your particular pet if they're just not going to let you brush. Question. Mm -hmm. In your experience, have you ever seen um, dental diets really work with cats? Well, the thing with the dental diets, so the, the dental diets are specifically made to, it's how the kibble is constructed to have this scrubbing effect. So there's a difference between dry food and a dental, mm -hmm. a specific dental diet. Um, so a lot of cats, and some dogs for that matter, they don't tend to chew the That's dry food well. well. And if they're not going to chew it, it's really not going to really make make any difference for them. Um, but it, I have seen cats that do. I think it, it can make a difference, and it has been shown to make a difference. Okay. But not, you know, not these cats that just kind of swallow it. And they're, they're kind of big too, so the kibbles are, are still swallowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so nutrition is is huge and. Boy, this is a topic that there's lots of different opinions and lots of information on, and some of it's supported with research and a lot of it isn't. Um, but I'm just going to make some general statements. Um, the senior diets, you know, for some pets they work well, but 
just because your pet hits a certain age and we might consider it senior does not mean they necessarily need a senior diet. Senior diets in general have reduced the calories. They've also reduced the protein a bit because they're assuming that they're not as active. They're also assuming that maybe their kidney function is not as, as, uh, as good as what it was when they were younger. But that's not necessarily true. And in fact, some senior pets need, need that higher protein because they're losing muscle mass through that aging process. So, you know, I tend to recommend, you know, a good quality diet um, that your pet does well with. And honestly, that fits your budget. There's, you know, some of these foods are $60, $70 a bag. So, um, and that, you know, that keeps the coat nice, that keeps the stools normal. Um, unless there's a medical reason, you know, that we've got liver disease or kidney disease where we may be actually looking at some of the prescription diets. Um, to help, then you know they may not necessarily need a senior diet per se. Uh, they don't tend to um, digest fats and proteins as well as when they were younger. So that's where kind of blanketly saying the senior diets, uh, you know, may not be for everybody. The other thing I don't have in here too, but is the dogs, the grain-free diets. They're they're just starting to track some issues with those diets. Um, and it's primarily cardiac. We're not sure, or the Department of Agriculture, um, I guess who's looking into this, um, that there's a, a link between, a statistical link between cardiac, a certain type of cardiac disease and grain-free diets in dogs. And I'm not sure whether it's the lack of the grains or whether it's what they're substituting the grains with. So you can Google that. You can find out more information. But that's kind of an emerging um, topic out there that you need to kind of be aware of, but you know, I didn't need to talk about it in this talk, but just to put it out there. So, <laughs> How did you get them to sit still? I, I didn't. <laughs> Somebody did. Um, so we want the diet to kind of meet the individual's needs, um, deal with these comorbidities, so for kidney disease, allergies, inflammatory bowel disease. Sometimes nutritional therapy is one of the main ways that we manage it, especially with kidney disease. Um, some of the research now is supporting that these early kidney diets, you know, they used to just, everybody that had even minor evidence of kidney disease went on a kidney diet, or, you know, which is ultra low protein. And their cats are obligate protein eaters, so they, they need relatively high level of protein if they have kidney disease. So what the, what's being done now is to start these cats on a modified protein. So we, we drop the phosphorus in the diet because that is important. Um, phosphorus, high levels of phosphorus will accelerate kidney damage. Um, but they try to keep those protein levels you know, higher, not, not as high as a regular maintenance diet, but higher than what the traditional um, KD, you know, those types of diets. So as the disease progresses and they get more end stage, then we, we have to lower that protein even more. But, um, you know, so that, you know, some of these diets really are, you know, showing good evidence that are helping these animals live longer. Um, enhanced palatability. So, you know, things that we can do to try to encourage our little seniors if their appetites aren't really good to get them eating, because that really is a prognostic indicator of how they're going to do. If, if they're losing weight, they're not eating. Um, well, we've got a, a hard battle to fight with them. So you can warm it to body temperature, um, moisten the foods or canned foods. Canned foods tend to be, particularly cats, we're recommending, recommending those more and more. Um, they don't have as much many calories pound for pound as dry foods, so they need to eat a little bit more of it because mostly what canned food, there's a lot of water in that. But for a lot of our little old senior kidney cats, um, we need that taking water. They do drink a lot and a lot of people tell them, oh, they have plenty of water. They're drinking all the time. But the problem is their kidneys aren't concentrating the urine, so they're just expelling a lot of really dilute urine, so they can't keep up with their normal hydration needs. So our easiest way to do that is to um, just kind of get them to eat more canned foods. You can add broths, you know, low-salt broths, um, to soften it if their teeth bother them, and that sometimes perks up their interest. Small frequent meals, sometimes they do better with that than like one or two big meals a day. Uh, you want 
their, their ability to get to their food and their water um, to be easy um, and easily accessible. So sometimes, you know, you've got an older cat and then you get a puppy and the puppy keeps eating, getting into the cat food, so you put the cat food up on the dryer and the cat has to jump up there to eat. Um, you know, they don't have, they don't have any choice, I don't want to starve, but with arthritis, or muscle tone, that's a really challenge, challenging thing for them to do. And sometimes they'll just decide, eh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip a meal. So they may not eat as well if they have to, you know, really go through a lot of gymnastics to get to their food. Um, you might have to modify the, the bowls, maybe you've got some neck pain in the dog, bring the bowl up a little bit, um, and make sure they're on good traction. You know, all of our, a lot of our houses now are tile or wood, and that's really tough on these older dogs that have arthritis, so making sure they're standing on a nice traction surface. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And I mentioned the body weight. I, I think with cats, having a little scale, like a, just an inexpensive pet scale at home, is really a good thing to have because the weight is so important. Uh, trends in either direction, you know, if they keep getting heavier and heavier, we want to know about that because it's, it's often not a matter of what if, it's a matter of when they become diabetic. Um, but as they get older, we start to see usually that typical weight drop, which is usually a red flag that there's something going on and we need to kind of look into that. And it's very stressful to bring cats to the vet. So, you know, most vets are fine bringing them in and, you know, come on and weigh them periodically. But I know it's stressful. So sometimes having either a used baby scale or an inexpensive pet scale at home where you can track what the weight's doing and then call if you notice a trend one way or the other. I think, I think that's a really important thing. Um, when they're older, and particularly we know they're battling things like thyroid disease or kidney disease, well, you know, you know, every few weeks, at least every three or four months. Um, and as I said, the progressive weight loss is often one of our first indicators that there's a problem before they're going to show up. Well, so a lot of people want to know, should I give them supplements? And it, it kind of depends. I mean, um, with arthritic dogs, we do use a lot of fish oils with omega-3 fatty acids. Cats and kid with kidney disease or chronic GI disease will use B vitamin supplements. Um, the glucosamine, chondroitin sulfates, we kind of think of them, they're not gonna hurt, they might help. So we tend to recommend them. Um, probiotics we're using more and more as more evidence comes out supporting that you know, they may have a beneficial effect. And then in some diseases, um, antioxidants can be helpful. But what you wanna try not to do is put all this stuff in there and create a food aversion. And this is, again, going back to our cats. You gotta pick your battles with them. Um, if you, sometimes if you just put something in there that they don't like, and they smell it or they taste it, and they, turn, they walk away from it, next time you put that food down, even if it's not tainted, they're not gonna eat it. So you gotta be really careful with hiding things in food, especially like medications, because one, most medications don't taste so good, and two, we're not gonna know if they're gonna get the whole dose if they eat around it or it starts to dissolve, and we definitely don't wanna make the food aversion happen. So the endocrine system, probably the most common thing that we see in our seniors with hyperthyroid disease is almost exclusively a disease in older cats. Um, dogs tend to get hypothyroid disease, uh, not necessarily always when they're older, um, but uh, it usually, almost always is a benign thyroid tumor, we don't know what causes it. We do occasionally have a malignant version of this disease, but it's, it's usually benign. And very classic symptoms, usually they're, they're losing weight even though they're eating normally, uh, or oftentimes they're just hungry all the time, always hungry. They rip into cereal boxes, and, you know, whatever they, need, they can find when they're hungry. Um, PUP, polyuria, polydipsia, so they tend to drink a lot and they pee a lot. They do tend to be vomiters. Sometimes they, you know, because they have diarrhea, a lot of them are kind of restless. They walk around just yelling, vocalizing. Um, it tends to be, you know, a high level of suspicion when you see an older cat, lost a lot of weight, and you can palpate right down here where the thyroid is, and you feel this big goiter, this big thyroid mass. Um, they often have really high heart rates. Uh, sometimes they have a heart murmur. They don't kind of groom themselves as well, so their their coats look kind of they look very straggly. Um, and a lot of them have high blood pressure with it too. 
So we, we run thyroid screening, we, we check what their thyroid levels are, and we generally will look at other things too, um, complete blood count, and chemistry in particular, because it's very common that your hyperthyroid cats also have kidney disease. And if we overcorrect or correct too aggressively the thyroid, we're going to make the kidney disease a lot worse. So we have to be aware of everything. Remember what we said before, it's, it's usually not one thing going on in these little seniors. So we're kind of balancing, keeping all these plates spinning. Um, we look at the urine because a lot of times they've got, um, the older cats get urinary tract infections, not, not so commonly when they're young, but as they get older, we see urinary tract infections. And then you know, blood pressure measurement is kidney disease and thyroid tends to predispose them to hypertension, which will make kidney disease worse. And we don't usually diagnose with ultrasound, but if we're worried that it may be more of a malignant type of a tumor there, we can ultrasound it. It's treated in a variety of ways. Probably the most common, at least when we start off treating these cats, is with a drug called methimazole. And what it, do, it doesn't do anything with the tumor, but it, per, it inhibits the production of more of this thyroid hormone. So the tumor keeps growing, and this is, this is sort of the, the downside to this kind of therapy. Um, the tumor keeps growing, and a lot of these cats over time, they need higher and higher doses, and it becomes less effective. But it's probably the most common way that it's managed. Um, radioiodine therapy is sort of the gold standard if it's the right cat, um, where they give them an injection of a radiated compound that only goes to the abnormal thyroid tissue. It doesn't do anything to normal tissue, and it destroys it. And from the vast majority of those cats, that's it. That's curative. Um, there are a few, a friend of mine I was like, you got to get this done. It's the best way to treat it. And of course, her cat was one that needed it. Treatment, but, but usually it's it's uh, it's curative. Um, you know, which do you pick? Well, it depends. I think a little bit on the age. So if you've got a, a 17 or 18 year old cat that was diagnosed with hyperthyroid disease, um, you know, radio radio iodine therapy is going to run you probably a few thousand to have them done. So probably probably not a candidate for that. If there's kidney disease, you know, once we correct it with the radioiodine therapy, uh, we have to be, you know, we can't take that back. So at least with the medications, we can adjust the dose a little bit. And a lot of times what we do is we start them on the drug and see how their kidneys tolerate bringing the thyroid down before we consider whether or not radioiodine therapy is a way to go. <laughs> iodine therapy to kidney disease? So it's not so much the therapy, it's it's the disease itself. So a lot of these cats, they also have concurrent kidney disease. And so the kidneys are a little bit dependent on that. Maybe higher blood pressures, filtration rate to kind of keep them healthy, working as well as they can. And when we bring all that down after we correct the thyroid, we can push that kidney failure further along more quickly. Surgery is um, surgery can be done. I think it used to be done years ago more commonly than it is now because most cats are either going to be on the medications or they're going to have the, the uh, radioactive treatment. There is a diet. I really don't know too many people that use it. YD diet. Um, it's a low, very low iodine diet, so you have to be careful if you have a multi-cat household, you don't want your non-thyroid cats eating it. Um, it it's okay. You know, I, I would say that's the last resort to, to try to treat this disease with, with diet therapy. Um, all the therapies, there's risks and benefits you know, to each, uh, but the way you kind of sit down and make that decision, talking with your vet, you look at the age and what are we finding on our physical and what are the comorbidities. So we already mentioned, you know, probably at 17, you're not going to go for radioiodine therapy. We may just manage them on the medications if they've got concurrent kidney disease, depending on what stage they're at. Probably not going to go for something like iodine therapy and, and cost. So if you've got a, you know, a 12-year-old cat that's diagnosed with this, you know, spending a little more upfront with the radioactive treatment might be in your best interest because you conceivably have a cat that can live to be 16 or 17 that you're getting blood work done every six months, you're paying for the cost of the medication. So in a, in a youngish cat that's diagnosed with the disease, I think it's definitely probably more cost effective to do.
uh, uh, radiation therapy. And it's, it's a one single injection of this compound. They're, they're in the hospital for a few days just till the radiation levels die down, but they're just kind of boarding and not, they're not constantly being treated. Um, I think I put here the living arrangement. Uh, mostly that has to do with, with using a YD diet, but also medications, you know, if, if the only way you feed, you can get the medication is you put it in the food and everybody's eating out of the same bowl. That may not be a, a good arrangement. And the temperament of the cat as well. Uh, can you medicate this cat every day? Uh, fortunately, with the methimazole, it's one of the few drugs that we know is absorbed uh, across the skin or transdermally, so you can get a little gel that you rub in the ear. It works pretty well in most cats, but sometimes they don't want to let you do that, so lots of considerations there. Little angel. Mm -hmm. um, so heart disease. Um, mitral valve disease is by far the most common type of uh, heart disease that we see in dogs. Very common in older, small breed, and medium breed dogs. The Cavalier King Charles, Chihuahua Poodle, especially the cats, are, are really um, predisposed to it. And they get it much, much younger. That's my little Percy, and he was much, much younger. <laughs> the snowball stuck all over. Um, so the, there are four valves in the heart that control blood flow depending on the cycle of the heartbeat. Uh, the mitral valve is one, it's on the left side. And what happens, we don't know or understand why, but these leaflets, are, they thicken. It's a slowly progressive disease. And then they don't close properly, so they get become leaky when the heart beats. Blood kind of squirts in a direction that it shouldn't. And that abnormal blood flow is what creates the, the murmur that we hear, and over time leads to enlargement of the heart. And eventually, we're not talking about weeks, we're talking about years, leads to and early on for you know really for years these dogs had no symptoms um, we might pick up a heart murmur you know as they start to come in after they've had it you know for a couple of years um, as it worsens and you're looking more that the heart is not working efficiently they might be intolerant to exercise um, you, you start to get a really advanced thing called cardiac cachexia so you start losing weight You'll hear a cough in dogs. Cats don't cough so much with heart disease. Um, that's more like respiratory, the asthma, those kinds of things with cats. But they don't tend to cough when they have their versions of their heart diseases. Um, and then any kind of increased, persistent increased respiratory rate. Uh, and then when we're really, really getting serious, they get that bluish look, the cyanotic mucous membranes, and then finally they can collapse. Um, but that's really the end stage. So on an, you know, an x-ray with moderately advanced heart disease, we'll see the heart is, is enlarged and it pushes up. It's causing the trachea. Instead of coming straight in, it kind of pushes the trachea up. And that, that often can irritate the airways and can trigger a cough. So it's not necessarily heart failure uh, in the beginning that causes a cough. Um, and the treatment really depends on the stage. So when we hear a murmur, we'll often talk about getting a baseline echo at some point so we know what's what's going on with this little heart. Um, many times, if it's early in the course of the disease, the, the cardiologists don't recommend doing anything. You know, maybe check it again in a year or six months, depending on what stage it's at. Um, nutritional support, probably more important in those dogs that have more advanced disease that we're trying to get them to eat because they don't feel well. Uh, but you probably don't want a high, really high sodium diet for them. That's why low salt broths and things like that will be helpful. A whole variety of medications that can be used. Mobendin is, is becoming kind of a star of uh, managing these diseases, and they always argue back and forth with cardiologists when to start it in these dogs. So um, it's, it's, I think in general they're starting to start it earlier than, instead of waiting until their, their diseases progress more because it definitely has been shown to prolong the, the lives of, of these dogs. Um, cough suppressants if you know they're, they're just chronically coughing and everybody wants to know you know is there supplements that can help and and most of the cardiologists I talk to say no not really there's nothing that's been shown to help with this degenerative process that just keeps going on with these valves I had one that said yeah well sometimes I put them on CoQ10 um, my little cavalier has it I have them on it I, I don't know if it helps it doesn't hurt so I, I kind of put that in there and then just regular monitoring. Uh, that might be an echo once or twice a year in the early stages or early to mid stages. Maybe 
doing a chest x-ray, definitely getting their hearts listened to, and if you know, notice anything, they're starting to cough more, they're exercise intolerant, or their resting breathing rate is increasing, then uh, you know it's definitely worth getting them checked out. Kidney disease, big, big problem in cats as they get older. We, don't, we do see it in dogs, but we see it much more commonly in, in cats. And again, we don't know why. I mean, there's lots of theories as to why all these little cats are going into kidney failure as they age. But it, again, like the mitral valve disease, it's chronic and progressive. It's not going to happen in a, in a week or two. Uh, it happens over months and years. And that's why it's so hard, so insidious in cat that it's not going to show us anything to know, should we do blood work now? You know, what's going on? So that weight, you know, checking that weight is important. Um, there's different stages of kidney disease depending on where their blood pressures are, protein loss, all different parameters that we use to stage it. But what we as pet owners will notice usually early on is they start to drink more. And then they pee more. So you, even if you're like, well, I, I don't know, you know, I never see them drink, you just kind of think, well, look, I'm, I'm scooping out bigger clumps of urine out of the box, or I'm having to empty the box more. That might be a little indicator maybe they are drinking more than, than what they normally did. And again, the reason for that is that one of the first things that goes is the kidney's ability to concentrate the urine. So uh, they're producing, they're drinking a lot, they're peeing out a lot of this really di large amounts of dilute urine because they've, they've lost that concentrating ability. So it's really tough for them as the disease progresses to drink enough to stay hydrated. So they always walk around, you know, kind of subclinically dehydrated, and that can lead to a lot of these other problems like constipation. An older cat that comes in constipated almost always has kidney disease or something else going on that's making them subclinically dehydrated. So keeping them hydrated is super important, and that's where the canned foods tend to come in if they'll eat it. Um, even adding a tiny bit of, of water or broth, if you make it too soupy, especially too quickly, they're not going to eat it. Um, just remember, yet you also have to account for the calories because. Uh, by adding a lot of liquids in there, you're going to dilute your calories. And canned food isn't as high in calories as dry food. Um, they might just be more finicky. You know, when people say, "Oh, they're just they're just finicky," um, I see. I guess I see this more in dogs, um, where you know, they only want a certain dog food, and then they only want treats, and then they they only want table food, and then they only want a certain kind before. So a lot of times they don't just acutely stop eating unless it's more of a catastrophic acute kidney failure. They just get more picky about what, what they want to eat. And you have like five different brands of dog food in there. And then you end up buying chicken. <laughs> you know, buy, go to McDonald's and get chicken McNuggets for this. <laughs> um, but and, and as it progresses, with, no matter what species you're talking about, they, their appetites just get worse and worse. They get weaker. They lose tremendous amounts of weight. More lethargic vomiting is a, is a big sign with um, more mid to end stage kidney failure. They can even get these really painful ulcers in their mouth, and breath is really bad. Um, dehydration is a big thing with vomiting. So you can feel, particularly when they've lost a lot of weight, you can feel these small little kidneys. And they kind of look like thyroid caps. They tend to be thin. Uh, they, they don't groom themselves well because they don't feel well. They're often dehydrated. Halitosis or that, that breath we talked about. And a lot of times they're constipated. A lot of times they do have thyroid disease on, on top of it. So, you know, we start with the basics. We, we need to kind of get a broad look at what's going on there so we can narrow it down and narrow it down. So we, we do this baseline blood work, a complete blood count. Kidney disease, as it gets pr more progressive, we'll see anemias with that. So that's why it's important to look at a complete blood count, which tells us about white cells and red blood cells and all of that and the ratios. The chemistry profile is what really gives you a look at what do those kidney values look like, what do the liver values look like, thyroid level is often included in that, the senior profile is a T4, urinalysis, <coughs> uh, and oftentimes urine culture, as I said before, the urine tract infections in younger cats are really not that common. <coughs> All these little male cats that, that start peeing blood or straining to urinate, mm -hmm. put them on antibiotics and they got better, we're like, oh, they got a bacterial infection. Well, it would have probably gotten better if we had done nothing because uh, this sterile cystitis has a natural waxing and waning. It's, it's very strongly linked with stress. Ohio State is doing a lot of research on that. 
But as they get older, we definitely do start to see more true kidney infections. So we often will talk about if we see suspicious uh, evidence in the urine to run a culture, if you've got a kidney infection, um, that's one of the few things that we can do that might help preserve directly that kidney function. It's kind of hit or miss though because we can't get a culture right out of the kidney where the infection might be. We're getting urine from the bladder. So our hope is, is that if we, we grow something out of the urine we collect from the bladder, it will represent what could be going on in the kidney. Um, we always like to know, we get a baseline on their blood pressures. Um, because with, with kidney disease, just like in people, a lot of times they have high blood pressure and that's going to make the kidney disease worse. And then you can do x-rays or ultrasound is even better because uh, the ultrasound can really actually look inside those kidneys. It's non-invasive, they're not asleep for it, they shave their belly, but it really can give us a good feel of not only what the kidneys look like, but everything else in that belly. And treatment is managing all of the things that happen. The kidneys have such a major role, they're responsible for controlling blood pressure, for stimulating the production of red blood cells, um, eliminating toxins, concentrating the urine, the list goes on and on. So you, uh, as you start to have decline in function, you start to see all these little things start to, the wheels fall off. So you're, you're trying to manage and monitor for all those things. So the anemia, the high blood pressure, um, azotemia, you may have heard that word, where these kidney toxins are actually building up in the bloodstream, like hyperphosphatemia, all these the potassium levels drop. So these blood panels are really helpful to us to help guide treatment for these old cats um, and dogs too. Uh, we want to know if they've got hyperthyroid disease and how we're going to manage that. Keeping them eating is hugely important. And like I was saying before, you know, we've kind of gone away and unless they're really advanced the disease to putting on these ultra low protein diets. So we do these early renal diets now that um, that really help keep that protein going to help them maintain muscle, uh, but they're lower in phosphorus than your normal cat foods that you would buy. Um, so we do try to use, in this case, a prescription diet, but I will say the most important thing is that they eat. If they're not going to eat these diets, they're not going to eat it. They need to eat something. So um, having them on, you know, lower phosphorus canned foods. There's some, um, there's some of the uh, over-the-counter canned foods, you know, like the pate styles that tend to be a little bit lower in phosphorus, certainly the carbs too then like the chunks and things like that. But the most important thing is that they eat. And we like the canned foods because they've got extra water intake, but if they're not gonna eat it, you gotta give them what they want. Um, and then full, small frequent meals for these guys too. We often don't feel like eating you know, a bunch at one time. Because this disease affects cats very commonly, and we've mentioned before, cats and medications never go together very well. We really have to pick and choose what's the most important thing to get into them. So that might be an appetite stimulant, at least initially, till we get meeting again, uh, getting them on some phosphate binders if their phosphorus levels are high, uh, anti-nausea medications. So you kind of pick and choose from these depending on how sick they are and what you're gonna be able to give to your cat every day without it you know, hating and running from you, hating and running from you, because that you don't want to disrupt that bond that you have. Um, I would say that once they hit a certain stage of kidney disease, fluid support is, is huge. And usually um, that means we're, we've gone beyond the step where just giving them extra fluid in their diet is helpful. We need to actually give them these subcutaneous fluids. And you've probably had cats that you've had to do this with. I'm sure some of you have. And I'd say not all of them, but most of them tolerate it pretty darn well. And what we're doing is we're delivering we're delivering a bolus of fluids. Uh, we take advantage of the fact they have a big subcutaneous pocket, so you, know, you can lift their skin up, put a little needle in there, and get them nice and comfortable. Um, and then we deliver, usually, depending on if they have any heart disease or whatever, anywhere from 50 to 100 milliliters of fluids. Early on, that might be once a week, but as it progresses, sometimes it ends up being every day. It's just, these are all individuals. Um, now what this really does, most part, it, it keeps them hydrated, and that keeps them feeling good, and that keeps them eating. So that's the main reason that we often will go to those fluids. And I've seen cats live for years with 
kidney disease on these little fluids you know, a couple times a week. And it eventually catches up with them, but it can really make a big, big difference for them. Um, adjunctive treatments like acupuncture and massage, uh, I think acupuncture, sometimes for nausea, can be helpful in some cats and, and dogs that have uh, kidney disease. Um, massage, again, just kind of a well-being thing. You know, they don't feel well, they kind of sit around, they're not moving around a lot, so their muscles get tight, and a lot of times they don't have really good muscle mass, so they're more prone to muscle soreness. Um, herbs, you know, we, we don't know a lot. I, I'm very open to, you know, hearing and learning more about that. The cats can to be well, all animals, but in cats we have to be really careful because they're so they're so um, different than most other species in how they tolerate and how they metabolize the drugs and things that we give them. And so many things that you or I or a dog could take is toxic to a cat. So you always have to be really careful. But um, I know some veterinarians that do mostly alternative medicine really um, feel that having your cats on some of these herbal supplements like Romania things like that, do see if it makes a difference. And make sure you got those warm, comfortable beds around. Uh, try to maintain their life as close as you can to what it was before they became sick. A nice, quiet environment. Like I was saying, easy access to get to their food and their water and their litter boxes. You don't want to have a skinny little sick cat have to go down a, a flight of dark stairs to get to their, their litter box in the middle of the night. Otherwise, they might just start peeing on the carpet. And keeping them mentally engaged and stimulated. Uh, hmm. Allow them to get you know, access to where they love to be up in the windows. They love to be up high, but maybe they can't jump up there anymore. So it's really going to be beneficial to keep, um, to keep their mental health happy, I guess, to give them maybe a little stairs to get up there. Um, let's kind of jump now to arthritis, because that's a, osteoarthritis. That's a, a huge one that we see a lot. And I think a lot of people are surprised to know that, um, you know, maybe a two-year-old dog that has a cruciate injury and we feel the knee and they say, oh, he's already got arthritis. And they're like, how can they have arthritis? They're only two years old. Um, so it really is more a reflection of uh, joint instability, osteoarthritis. Not, we won't talk about rheumatoid arthritis. So if you've got a, a cruciate, an ACL tear, or a partial tear, and you're a one and a half year old Labrador running around, and you've got this knee that's just grinding back and forth, you're going to have arthritis at two. But most pets we see come in uh, toward the you know latter stage of their life with more advanced arthritis. So probably the most common cause of chronic pain in our dogs and cats. We used to never think cats got arthritis because vets weren't smart enough to know how to look for it. But now we know that they get it very commonly and they get it early in life. And like everything, they hide it really well. So most people aren't walking their cats so they don't see them limping. Um, it's very subtle signs, like I don't see them up in the windowsill as much as I used to. Or they, they jump up on their chair, but it takes them you know, two or three attempts um, to do it. Whereas before, they used to just jump right up. It's those kind of things that you have to watch for in the cats. They're not as obvious as dogs. Um, it's a progressive disease. We can't stop it, but we definitely can manage it. And this is one of those diseases that if we can intervene early, we stand a much better chance at having them live more comfortably and mitigating some of the, the, the uh -oh. things that happen. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the laptop shutting down. Gosh. There will be a two-minute pause. Uh, <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yeah, good, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> any stories about their own little seniors? <laughs> we, we have two uh, 15 year old and four month, four, 15 year, four month old Siberian Husky sisters oh that used to be sled, they're retired sled dogs. We have uh, six dogs we we had and uh, wow. and, um, <laughs> and that for that breed that's that's yeah. amazing. Well, we've had them at seventeen. Wow. wow, are they related? Like, yeah, they're sisters. There the ones go. we yeah. have now, they're they're yeah. litter mates. So there's that genetic. And we um, yeah we have, our, their, and one of their their two, their two sons, uh, one's two sons, and they're going to be thirteen, and <clears throat> we just unfortunately lost the 
13 and a half year old male. He got away at my cabin in Tioga County, he got into a porcupine and blinded him. Oh, and, oh, that was horrible, yeah. Yeah, and we, he couldn't yes, find his way home, and then we away. found him yeah. passed yeah. along the stream. And we spent, she spent 16 days looking for him. She stayed at camp oh. looking for him. Yeah, we could. Yeah, at least we have closure. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, somebody had mentioned. I was telling uh, when we were going up to the mountains this past weekend to get my dog's ashes because yeah. he was falling down. Um, our one dog that uh, we were just talking about um, when she we got up there, she was having a hard time getting up and and, and, and until then she was chasing the two year old yeah. that we adopted around the yard. You know, she's mm -hmm. a little mentally like slow, but yeah. she, physically she We're was still fine. That and so we took her in, and um, somebody today had mentioned um, this drug, G A B A P E M. Yeah, yeah. 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 and said that that yeah. might be good because she, she she is a little shaky. Yeah. You know, so we gave her. We, we took her to the vet upstate, and the vet put her. We put her on subcutaneous because she was. Dehydrate. I thought she might have been dehydrated from the ride up because she seemed a little. Now the dog has traveled with us all over the country. The mm -hmm. dog, the dog ran, ran a race in Drummond Island, Michigan, as a lead. Wow. You know, year, several years ago for friends of ours. Uh -huh. um, so she's she's well seasoned traveler, but she seemed to get stressed. Yeah. That that trip and she was drooling a lot. And I I immediately like um, she's dehydrated. Let's get water in her. She didn't do much better the next morning, so let's take her into the vet local. And she, we did subcutaneous, you know, rehydrated, and uh, some other. And they figured ran all blood work and everything on her, and she seemed that we couldn't find anything really wrong with her. And she seemed to come back. They put her on a light antibiotic because she might have a urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. um, she's doing better, but now she said we're having a little incontinence issues. We're getting up and stuff, you know, because of her age. And we've got to kind of help her up, um, yeah. and, and uh, you know, so she was she had heard about this mm -hmm. medication. Yes. Is this for joint pain? So gabapentin is um, it's being used more and more, I think, in, in veterinary the veterinary world, and it's um, basically a drug that uh, help. It's not a pain drug per se, but it helps in certain situations of pain. So chronic pain is, is a big one, um, and what we call neuropathic pain, uh, pain directly related to like nerve injury, spinal cord injury. Uh, the reason that we use it in chronic pain is that what we know now about living with chronic pain, and this isn't whether you're a person or a horse or whoever, is that your nervous system undergoes anatomical changes with chronic pain grow more of these pain nerve endings and they're also more they're what we call hypersensitive so it doesn't take this is why you know people would go pet their dog that had hip, hip dysplasia and they try to snap or right and feel rather just being annoyed because they're not that that non-painful stimulus truly triggers a pain reaction in what we call this wind-up state and once once those nerve changes happen, it can be really hard to back that down, and that's where gabapentin seems to really help these dogs. Does it help in backing it down or preventing it? Preventing the, the further progression. Further progression. Okay. Yeah, it's or a good backing question. it up yeah. from where it is. Yeah, um, it probably does not help undo the damage that's been so, done. But what we're trying to do is ratchet further. it back down and maybe make it less severe. Probably won't stop it, but make it less severe. It, there's a huge dose range on it, um, pretty much the limiting factor on how high you can go tends to be how sedate they get, assuming there's everything else is healthy, you know, the kidney, liver, and all that, because it can be a bit sedating. It also has a, a bit of an anti-anxiety effect, particularly in cats, so we use it a lot in cats coming in. By itself, though, I would say if this is really osteoarthritic pain, I don't think it's going to by itself do what you need. Yeah. It needs to be combined. It works best in combination. We give her glucosamine. We've been giving her for several years, and she has had. Well, that's what retired her. She tore her ACL. Yeah. From running, um, it, you know, it was. I mean, we ran her, but it was recreational. You know, mm -hmm. we're not far from professional dog mm -hmm. sledders, but for fun and recreation, and give you know, 
and she's had the ACL repairs. Um, and she was doing wonderful. She's running around the yard chasing the two year old. I wonder if she did something because they can uh, make the damage the iliopsoas, like this, this muscle tendon. She's not favoring thing. anything, that, and that's why I thought because we, we, we travel. They, they, they're crated when they travel. I have a, a rolling dog kennel with mm -hmm. each dog gets a crate small to keep them from moving around. And I thought maybe she, you know, hit the brakes or a bump or something, and she bumped herself. They also have some spinal, you know, if she's got like progressive, you know, they can get this lumbosacral disease, which is a kind of an impingement on the spinal cord, the lower part of the back, and they'll get weak in the back and they'll be painful. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's probably not something that's going to hurt, you know, the gabapentin, but I think by itself, you may need to. Want, I have my laptop. Is that oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I gave gabapentin to a raccoon for my seizures. Oh, did you? Yeah, it can be used for seizures. Yeah, exactly. We don't, it's not our first drug that we go to in dogs and cats with seizures, but in people it can be used. And, okay. and sometimes it yeah. Yeah. Is your dog also grieving? Um, uh, I don't. I she see. She seems like she has a little doggy dementia because she's mm -hmm. she's kind of old. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, she, she it, was physically better than her sister. Mentally, her sister's better than her. Okay. But her sister was also a mother had had litter of puppies, which we mm -hmm. had. We we had kept three of the seven in the one litter. I know they definitely uh, felt the loss. Oh, yeah. 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 We, we, we have lots of senior guys. Yeah. 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 But, yeah, so, so gabapentin, um, I think massage. We'll talk about a little bit more. Yeah, yeah somebody had just, I, I, I was taking an uh, HTML class today, and somebody mm -hmm. I mentioned it. I, I, she said, oh, well, my dog mm -hmm. was on this, and it helped it, you know, because the back legs weren't, yeah. you know, were shaky or something our, like that. Our non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs often are our best tool to get that um, inflammatory pain down. Yeah, I don't even know if she's in their, pain. I mean, she didn't. That's the thing too. I honestly, I assume they are until yeah. I can prove they're not. Because a, dog, a breed like that is going to, you know, it's going to kind of pull through. They, some of these dogs don't. Literally, that leg could be dangling by a tendon, and they're still running with the tennis Jeez. ball and chasing yeah. the balls, and, mm -hmm. and they don't vocalize. That's mm -hmm. the thing, a really uh, big point I want to get across is people come in and say, yeah, they're not in pain because they're not crying. They don't vocalize with chronic pain. If you mm -hmm. stepped on their foot by mistake, you, you'll hear a yipe or you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing, but they're not like us. They don't complain. They don't whine um, yeah. when they're living with just that kind of chronic, everyday, achy achy pain. Um, they just change how they get around, how they do things. Okay. I'm like, let go up here. Can we get this phone? Do you have PowerPoint on here? Oh, that was the other thing. Oh, you know what? It's just it's in the top of the micro two to the big Actually, it's in like 2000. I just. Here? Yeah, that's what PowerPoint is. Actually, hang on. Is it one of these? Yes, it's one of these. It's down a little modified. Right. So with five senior dogs at 10 and above, I well, just want you to know that we are very active supporting the veterinary clinic. <laughs> <laughs> veterinarians in Chester County. I can imagine. And, and, and Tioga County. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, bless your heart. You, know. you must have a good financial planner. <laughs> no, not right now. I'm no, I'm, I'm going to be I'm moving in with the, the dogs soon. I'm know you like it. Like, please. <laughs> We all work so that our pets can have better lives. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So I say mine, they let me pay the mortgage. Yeah. 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 They pretty much run the show. 
Are you familiar with uh, pet plan insurance? Pet plan insurance. Pet plan. Um, not. I've heard of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was, I almost got got into that company. I was like hoping and praying for that. Yeah. <laughs> they offered free pet insurance. That's why they didn't hire. They saw how many Well, now we can't afford you. that. Yeah. Well, don't feel too bad. But the that's owners true. have King Charles. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's probably what it started. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, we got that pretty much in my head. It's it's better than nothing, but I heard there are other companies. They're becoming a little more competitive because there's you know there's there's definitely a need. I I do think pet is is a good idea. It's cheaper when they're younger. Be really careful of what they cover, what they don't cover. Um, but I do think it I do think it helps. You know, we can do so much now. We can they do renal transplant at Penn. You know, one of the few facilities in the world Jeez. that school at Penn is doing kidney transplants and these crying kidney for other cats. Mm. Um, we can give them new hips. We can do brain surgery. But, you know, I, most dogs, cats that I see every day aren't going to need that. But it's the, you know, my puppy just got in the trash or just ate a bunch of mulch and now it's vomiting for two days and we need to do x rays or blood work. You know, that's 300 or whatever. Mm -hmm. right there. That's where I see it kind of help well, Sienna, the one that we're talking about, she had both uh, had ACL done. I think they were oh, two grand each, yeah, or twenty yeah. five hundred each. Yeah. So I put five into that. Six million dollar knees, I know. Yeah, yeah. she's a, she was not a cheap dog. Yeah. So um, you mentioned it's it's uh, generally progressive but manageable. It's diagnosed early, especially. What you're going to see is kind of a lameness or a stiffness. And it might be intermittent. Um, and it's a lot of times is when they first get out, they, they kind of look a little stiff, but then they warm out of it. That's a really, that's a kind of a hallmark of, of an arthritis lameness. Um, what happens as you move around, you get this synovial fluid, this lubricating fluid moving over your joint surface. The PTs will tell people um, motion is lotion for your joints, and that's why you know, we'll talk about how we manage it, but the right kind of activity and exercise is important. Um, but, you know, as they become more painful, they may become, you know, less active. It, they hurt, they don't want to move, the less they move, the more they hurt. It's this vicious cycle. They can get irritable. We talked about that wind-up syndrome where, pet, you know, petting them, they're not being what they you truly are triggering a pain response um, by touching them or using, or, you know, some kind of stimulus that shouldn't be painful, but really does, because now the nervous system has just gone haywire. Uh, they can eat less, or they can eat more if they're painful. That's how they kind of cope with it. Um, cats, in particular, are not going to be grooming themselves as well if their backs hurt. They tend to get a lot of arthritis in the spine, um, the hips, the elbows. And in cats, and, and to some extent dogs, if it's too painful or uncomfortable for, they get, for them to get up and get themselves out or to get into the box, this is a really good point with cats. Uh, you know, the litter boxes we use, a lot of times we use what we think we want to have versus what's best for the cat. And so best boxes for cats are as big as you can get them. Uh, with arthritic cats, you may need to get lower sides. Be creative. You can use a, a sweater box. Or I, for my old cat, I got one of those drip pans you put under a washing machine. It has a little lip like that. It took up like a whole, <laughs> it was big, but she could get in and out of that really easily. Um, but it also, you know, if they're, they get in these smaller boxes and the way they, if they have back pain, posture to defecate or to urinate, that can be uncomfortable for them. So they often will go maybe on the next to the box or somewhere else where they, it doesn't hurt as much or just to climb in and out of it or climb down the stairs or back up the stairs. So easy access, make it a box that's easy for them to get in and out of. So how do we diagnose it? Well, on a physical exam, you're, you're feeling all these joints, you're feeling all the <coughs> muscles and tendons around there because oftentimes you have arthritis, but then you get secondary soft tissue injuries like us. You know, if you've got bad knees, it doesn't take long for your back to hurt because you walk differently. Right? Your whole biomechanics of movement is thrown off and you put strain on muscle groups that weren't meant to take that or tendons uh, that weren't meant to take that. So then you get all that other pain. Uh, you can feel these joints are often thick and uh, crepitance is that like it, it feels like what Rice Krispie sounds like. That's what we're talking about. Um, their range of motion, you know, they're just limited. 
uh, with either pain or with contracture of the soft tissues around there because they haven't been moving their joints normally. Um, they often you know, come in with these skinny little back legs because they haven't been using the, the legs normally. They're off weight. They're trying to put more weight on the front legs, so sometimes the elbows go out. Dogs take about 60% of their weight on their front legs, but these guys are doing more than that because they're trying to get off the back. And it's not usually equal. They might be you know, having it off the, the right back leg and toward the front. Uh, with cruciate disease, almost always, not always, but almost, there's a bilateral disease in dogs, unlike in people. So both of their knees, they don't know where to put their weight. Um, so we, we talk about x-rays, sometimes joint tabs, but that's more if we're worried about like a rheumatoid arthritis or an infection. Weight management, many multimodal therapy for arthritis. There's no one thing you're going to do that's, that's going to give them their best management of this disease. Um, if they're carrying extra weight, you said, oh, I'm only going to do one thing to help my, my dog or cat for arthritis, then get the weight off them. That's, that's the biggest thing. The, the extra weight, we used to think that that excess fat tissue was just a mechanical load, and that's part of it uh, on these joints. But now we know that this, uh, this tissue secretes some really potent, nasty inflammatory mediators that degrade the cartilage. And that probably is even more of a factor with arthritis than with the mechanical load on the joint. So if we can get that weight down, then we're really going to help them be much more comfortable and slow the progression. Pain management is huge, and I never like to come across like we're pushing drugs, but if we can't get them out of the cycle of them hurting and they don't want to move, they're going to hurt more, um, they're going to lose more muscle, they're going to get weaker, then we're really doing them a disservice. And we also have to think about their quality of life. So judicious use of these pain meds, I, I, you know, I do definitely factor that in for many of these dogs, at least initially. If we can get them where we can do it as needed, and that's, that's the goal. Um, but some of them are at a point where they do need something every day, and it's a combination. If, if we can combine a few different types of pain drugs that work at different levels of the spinal cord to influence that pain messaging going up and down the spinal cord, then we're going to do better. We're going to be able to use lower doses than if we picked one um, drug and tried to manage it that way. Uh, supplements, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfates. Again, there, there's people that really seem to think or feel that their, their joints are better on them. Then there's probably just as many that don't notice a big difference. Um, and I think we see the same one in our pets. But because they're so safe, we do recommend them. I think the trick is you know, the supplement industry in this country isn't well regulated, so you definitely want to try to look for something from a company that hopefully would have some independent testing. Um, Nutramax is a pretty good, pretty reputable company. They have a lot of joint supplements that they offer. Fish oils um, may have an anti-inflammatory effect, so by reducing some of these inflammatory mediators, maybe we can slow down progression of arthritis. Curcumins, like in turmeric, there's more and more study on that. The problem is the doses are pretty high. We don't even have like an official dose of um, how much to give, but in people it tends to be fairly high, uh, and it can cause some stomach upset. So um, we tend to rely on you know on the, the other more conventional supplements. Um, Adequan, I'll mention. We often lump it into the supplement category, but it actually is an FDA approved drug. So it means it has some more rigorous investigation than, than some of the oral supplements. Um, and it's an injection, and it's not into the joint. It's just given like we give a vaccine twice a week uh, for about four weeks. And then we do it um, either as needed or once a week, once a month, depending on how advanced. It works better if um, we get them before they're too far gone with the arthritis. And we really like it in cats because um, it's not uh, officially approved for using cats, but it's very commonly used in cats. Of, of a lot of drugs that we use, the companies don't pay to have the research done in cats. So we, um, but it's generally tolerated really well, pretty safe, so. Question on the medications and NSAIDs, that would be? That's your, the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that's like your Rimadyl, your Deramax, your okay. Novax. Like, I was wondering, like, for a dog over the counter, any, anything. Now they used to recommend aspirin, but I think aspirin doesn't. What the vets explain is aspirin doesn't play well with any of the other 
things they want to yeah, use. Absolutely. So now, because oh, we gave her a low dose, 88 milligram mm -hmm. aspirin, and but I had only given her one in the morning, and it was in you know in the afternoon. But they said that the aspirin's okay, but it does, if you're going to bring it in for the dog in for other things, yeah. don't because it doesn't play well, and eventually it's, it's not good long term for stomach. Yeah. That's but true. other than Remedil, is there anything? I mean, Remedil is a prescription. Everything's prescription. Is there anything over the counter? Not so much as far as drugs go. I mean, you have to be really careful with, you know, the ibuprofen type. You yeah. definitely would not do that. Tylenol is going to kill a cat. You know, one Tylenol. So, I definitely would talk to your vet before you do anything. The, the thing with aspirin, we used to give it because we didn't have anything better. You know, but they come out with these prescription drugs that tend to be um, safer as far as the GI tract and the kidneys go. But that whole NSAID class of drug, there is a potential risk. That's why we like to look at blood work before if there's certain other drugs they're taking, you have to be really careful. And it's true, if, if they're on the aspirin, then you got to do this washout where you have to wait you know, a week or 10 days before we can introduce anything else that might be more effective and safer. And there was, they did a study where they had low dogs on low-dose aspirin, I think it was like for three days, and they went and did a scope of their stomachs, and they saw these tiny, what we call petechial hemorrhages, tiny little pinpoint hemorrhages all in the lining of the stomach. They weren't showing any signs of GI irritation uh, uh, or ulcerations or anything like that, but we were starting to see those little stomach irritations, hemorrhages in there, even with just the short term. They just don't tend to tolerate the non-selective anti-inflammatories like we can. Um, so, but as far as over-the-counter medication-wise, there's probably not so much anything else. Everyone, all the vets I've spoke to recommend yeah. the Ravidil. In fact, the one, our one vet said, next time you have a dog, she said, I'll actually put a refill on it. If you have an older dog who's, you know, maybe yeah. running in the yard, comes in, it's a little sore. She said, you'd be better doing that than an aspirin, you know, like a Remedil from another prescription. She said, once I give it to you, I can't tell you where to give it, but that would right. be better than giving them aspirin. Right. Is what she I wish I wish that weren't true, because I know these drugs are expensive, and, you know, and, and to do it the right way, you know, you really want to look at blood work before you start it and monitor it, you know, a couple weeks after, and then if they're doing okay once or twice We're a year, not talking about long term. We're talking about one needed. time. Yeah. yeah. But um, but they definitely are safer, and the last thing that you know we want to do is cause any harm. So um, so ice, you know, you can do ice. That's kind of a, a, a good thing. You don't think about ice so much with our chronic arthritis, but if they have an acute flare-up, you know, put ice on there. They don't like it that much, but you know, put a, a t-shirt or a thin towel, and then your bag of peas or. You can make your own ice packs. If you get a Ziploc bag, put 50% water, 50% rubbing alcohol, and stick it in the freezer. And it really won't freeze. It'll get kind of slushy, and it's very cold. So you can use that for 15 minutes or a few times a day for a few days with an acute flare-up. Um, and then heat, you know, that particularly is helpful with the muscle pain they get, and muscle tightness and soreness because of moving differently, um, or a secondary injuries. And just like in people, stem cell therapy and platelet-rich plasma, PRP, you know, you're hearing more and more about it, and there's some people that swear by it, and there's others that say, look, it, it helped a little bit or it didn't help at all. I think the jury's still out, but I think it's promising that there may be some, um, you know, some, I don't know if anybody's had any stem cell or PRP in their dogs. Um, exercise is really important, like we were saying, it, but it's got to be the right kind of exercise. And Everything they love to do is probably the worst thing they should do. So picture that squirrel chase, that high velocity, they take off, they run, they stop, they pivot. Um, that's really tough on, on these joints. So leash walking is your best bet. Uh, if they haven't been really exercising much, you start with short distances and gradually work your way up as you see how they do. It's going to vary. You know, They may do great for a week, and then one day they're really sore. Um, and you kind of monitor that night or the next day, because on the walk, sometimes you don't see it. And then you just, you know, tweak it. If they look like a little sore that day or they did something extra, then you back down a little bit. But you get them up and move them a little bit. Um, regular and controlled. So running around in the yard. Most dogs, when they're out in the yard exercising, they don't 
they chase a squirrel, they walk over here and sniff, or they roll in the grass, but they're not doing kind of therapeutic walking, like you can control and release. Mm -hmm. And I just throw out this time of year, be really careful with the heat. Um, they cannot cool themselves with these humid days. Uh, they're very prone to heat injury um, and heat stroke. So err on the side of caution and keep them inside a little early in the morning. So exercise helps to keep their muscles strong. All these muscles around the joint are like shock absorbers, so that, that helps them be more comfortable. That synovial fluid's moving, so it keeps them the joints lubricated. Um, and it, it's good for them. They get out and they, they can sniff and they can you know, do what dogs do. So mental stimulation. You just don't want the weekend warrior. So no there are different ways. You know, swimming is really good if they like to swim. If they get stressed, then it's not a good thing to do. If you have access to a safe place, clean water where they can swim, then working up is very energy demanding, so you have to start slowly. But uh, that, that can be a really good way to exercise because there's no impact on the joints. Uh, leash walking, little exercises, you know, this dog's walking over little cavalletti rails to help work on joint flexibility and strength and proprioception where his legs are. And then it's still important, even if they can't walk far, is to get them out and let them, let them try to, you know, be the dog that they were. So maybe you push them in the cart and get them out, let them walk around a little bit, and you put them back in so you still can engage with them and have that time together. Uh, adjunctive treatments or acupuncture sometimes really respond well to it. It's not going to fix the arthritis, but it helps with pain perception. Massage, I really love that. Uh, I think that's really helpful for all these dogs, and they like it. Cold laser, uh, it's not as different than a cutting laser, but for some dogs, they seem to, to do okay with that. Shockwave, you don't hear as too much about that, but some studies show it can be helpful. Kind of <laughs> so, yeah, so massage is really, we oh, like giving it, you know, what studies have shown when you pet your dog or massage your dog, your stress hormones drop mm -hmm. too, as does theirs. So it's a win win. And you don't have to be a massage therapist, you just you know, start lightly, you don't want to hurt them, uh, but you can definitely. Uh, help with complications because they're moving so differently. You know, the shoulders get really tight. If they've got high end problems, they get spasms like we do, little trigger points. Uh, the home environment is really critical. So they lived their whole life getting on the bed and now they can't. That's really stressful and frustrating for them. So we give them a safe way to get on and off the bed by little pet stairs. Um, be careful that, you know, as soon as this dog comes down, it's going to wipe out on this hard floor. So. Um, gotta watch mm -hmm. that. Uh, keeping them, you know, safe in the in the car so they're not bouncing all over the place because that's not, you know, it's not safe. Plus they, you know, they hurt themselves in there. Traction is really important in our homes today because you know a lot of us don't have a lot of carpeting. Um, go to Five Below, get a bunch of cheap yoga mats. I have them all over my house, and they are. Uh, they're easy to take up if you get embarrassed and people come over and they can throw them in the wash, <laughs> hang them out in the line to dry, and they give them traction. Uh, they're going to yeah. not work as hard with them walking. They don't have to use as much muscle mm. strength. Even standing there to eat, it takes more strength to hold themselves in that standing posture than walking. So you see these legs start to go like this. Um, if they can be on something that's traction, they're not going to have to uh, overuse their muscles. And that's why also dogs with hip problems, when they have a bowel movement, they keep walking because it, they don't have enough the strength to hold themselves in that posture. So yoga mats work well. Some of the booties, there are these things called paws. They're, they're like little balloons almost that fit on the feet, and they stay on pretty well, but you just got to watch them. You can't leave them on long because they, they're kind of kind of tight, um, but they can provide some traction and, you know, on a slippery surface. Um, we talked about the litter box thing, modifying that, feeding station. So this is what you don't want to do. You know, this poor little thing, you don't want to have to jump up on the counter to eat. Um, so try to figure out a way to keep the dog out of the cat food area. They even make the indoor little collar things that can wear that, you know, the cat can get in, but the dog can't. Um, so uh, whatever it takes, but don't make it jump up on top of the counter or the dryer. Uh, therapeutic bedding. You'll spend like $150 on a bed and they'll lay right next to it. 
<laughs> or you buy him a heating pad, put it in his dog yeah. box for the old ones, and the two-year-old rips it up the same afternoon before they even get to use it. Um, mobility aids can be really helpful, and if, you know, I know we're all kind of like we're not going to do the carts, we're not doing the carts as we're paralyzed dogs, but I think of carts as a walker, um, just like we would use a walker. So this dog uh, has not lost full function of his back and legs. But it's really hard. He struggles to keep himself up in a normal walking position. So the cart helps him do that. And he can walk much further where he doesn't have to support his whole weight and he's in a more normal biomechanical position to walk than if he didn't have a cart. So carts aren't only for dogs, the little dachshunds that have lost the function in their back legs. They can really be helpful. And then this help him up harness. I love this thing. Um, you can get them online. I, I tend not to go with knockoffs of it. There might be some good ones out there, but it's worth the investment. Um, they can wear it all day long. You don't want to leave it on 24-7, but it's like little suitcase handles. You know, if you see them struggling to get up, you just bend down and just you know, help them right up, help them into the car. If you're walking on a slippery surface, you can steady them. If they're, you know, if they're a shorter dog or you're really tall, you can get a... Um, either a scarf or something like that, loop it through the handle and hold it upright. And I don't know what these things are, but I got them at Home Depot. They're, they're like these vinyl straps with like a swivel hook on, on the end. And they, I don't know if anybody does. And they're, so, because a lot of times they're walking and you're like, your wrists are going like this. So I just, you can clip the swivel hook on there and, and that just spins around. And you've got this nice strong strap. Um, so, but yeah, help them up harness. Um, they're, they're really, Really, I've never re recommended it to anybody that's come back and said anything, but thank God we have this now, especially the big dogs. Mm -hmm. um, we're, 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 almost, we're almost done. So the neurological system, I think probably the most common thing outside of you know, you know, brain tumors and things like that is this uh, idiopathic vestibular disease where usually, you know, a few times a month we'll get a call, I, my dog had a stroke, and they, they can have strokes, but this would be much more likely uh, what happened. You know, they wake up and their their heads are tilted, they're circling or falling down, their eyes are going, you know, going this stagnant back and forth. And um, we, for the most part, we don't know what triggers this acute onset vestibular disease in dogs, but it's pretty common in, in older dogs. Cats get it a little bit younger age, uh, but it comes on quickly. Um, they're really incoordinated. They're oftentimes. It, they're, they're nauseated because the, the world is kind of spinning around, so they can be vomiting, they don't want to eat. Um, they don't really have any other norm, abnormal neurological signs, and that's that's going to be your key differentiating factor between is this a stroke, is this a brain tumor, or is this just um, this old dog vestibular disease? Is, you know, are they seizuring? Are they showing us any other like weakness in the limbs? Because they don't have any of those. They just are are spinning, our eyes are moving. Um, so we face it, we don't, there's no vestibular test, you know, well you look in the ears because you can have sometimes really bad ear disease that causes it, but these dogs usually don't have that. So you do your physical exam. Um, you, typical is, you know, how old are they? Okay, well, it's a 12 year old lab and he was normal yesterday and now he's doing this. And that's pretty classic for this. Um, you, but you do always, you know, want to make sure you're considering these other things, your inner ear disease, brain tumor, any kind of neurological infectious disease or trauma. Um, and so we tend to fall back on our basics just to make sure that we're able to tell you that we don't miss something. Uh, but most of these dogs don't go and get a smile tap unless it's looking less like this vestibular. And it's really supportive care. There's nothing that we can do that is going to um, take it away most of them resolve on their own, sometimes within uh, a day or two, sometimes over several weeks. Sometimes they're left with a little bit of a head tilt, but most of them do tend to get better on their own. We just have to control their nausea, uh, keep them eating, keep them drinking. If they're not, then we support them with fluids, um, nutritional support if they're, you know, if they're so queasy they're not eating, helping them to get up and walk. Uh, definitely not on the slippery floors, keep them from falling and hurting themselves. Would they treat that with a steroid? Um, it's not. Some people do put them on steroids. Because that's what I think we put Sienna on. She's 
to get her to eat and you know kind of yeah. because they ran all the blood work urine yeah and yeah, everything was normal. fine yeah and all and it happened you know I don't and within think hours she couldn't walk there's there's no uh, there's no study that says steroids is always going to help but I know a lot of people do put them on steroids because they're also thinking well maybe there's something else going on so they're trying to cover for a lot of different things but most of these dogs even without any kind of therapy like that tend to get better on their own. Okay. So, um, so senility, we, we call it cognitive dysfunction, but it's a form of dementia in dogs, relatively common. Uh, it's a neurodegenerative disease that we see, and it has uh, very similar to early stages of Alzheimer's. In fact, the dog uh, in, is, an early, is a model for early Alzheimer's in people, a research model. And we see, you know, the beta amyloid plaques, the loss of neurotransmitters, um, and free radical production, which all are, we see all see with people too. Um, how do we, you know, what do we do when we're trying to assess whether our patients have this um, dementia or senility? There's lots of different scales that you can use with this disha. Uh, are they disoriented? You know, they go out and they forget how to come back in the door. Are they standing in the corner? Um, their social interactions, either they they become more aloof or they're just more clingy. Um, their sleep wake cycles are different. Maybe they're up all night and they, they, they sleep all day long. They may lose their house training and their activity patterns might change. Uh, a lot of them, they, they sometimes don't seem to recognize their owners or other mm -hmm. pets they're familiar with or even places they're at. Um, they, like we were saying, they might become more like, anxious and more clingy. The separation anxiety, we can see it in these, these little guys, but that's its own entity too, we see that pretty commonly. Um, and they just don't groom themselves and care for themselves. Maybe irritable, agitated, they might cry. You're always thinking, okay, this looks like it could be dementia, but we want to make sure we're not missing something else. So we, we do all those other things to check the physical exam, the blood work. Screening, you know, blood pressure, just making sure that, you know, we're confident when we come up with that diagnosis for you and says this is what we're pretty sure is going on. Since there's no quick, you know, we take a blood sample and say, okay, yes, this is the diagnosis. So we're ruling everything else out. Most of it is what you, as the owner, notice. Um, is this more a disorder, like with humans, where it's a disorder of exclusion? Where you have to rule everything else out, and whatever. A lot of things are like that. That's that's one of these. So there's no real. While they're still alive, there's no real well to, way it's to tell about the beta amyloid changes or right. anything else. Right. There's no. There's no blood test. There's no MRI scan. You know, those are all to rule out. Just like an epileptic, a dog that starts with a seizure. There's no epilepsy test. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. So we talk about blood tests and MRIs and everything. Tell, so we can tell you there's no brain tumor, um, but that's the only way we can diagnose it. And, and the signalment meaning, you know, is it an older dog or an older cat with these signs? And that puts that higher up than a, a five-year-old that starts to do some of this, you know, kind of get a feel. So it, again, it's what, you know, what people are noticing at home. Um, I had, I always stick, this always sticks in my mind, this woman came to me and she said, I, I think you know, they're, my dog's not sleeping as well. And I said, well, how, how do you know that? And she said, well, he just doesn't dream as much. And so she just was really tuned in to, to her dog's, mm -hmm. you know, sleep cycles and how he used to sleep and go into these dreams. Um, so treatment, again, like a lot of these senior pet disorders and diseases, because they don't usually just have one thing, we're, we're trying to manage them, we'll keep all the plates spinning, so we're managing the kidney disease or the thyroid disease arthritis um, that's going to keep them from being able to be up and be mentally engaged. Urinary tract infections that might make them up feel sick. Um, arthritis that's going to make them irritable and painful. Uh, the big thing with this specifically is making sure that you have a predictable daily routine for them, but it's stimulating for them. Um, you don't want to do quick changes in their environment. And if you can, you can avoid it. Don't, don't change like their environment around too much if you can avoid it. The right kind of exercise and 
really being clever and thinking of ways that we can mentally challenge them and teach them new things. That, that has been shown to be the best way to kind of stave off these changes is to keep them mentally engaged. Um, so you can buy these little puzzle toys, uh, little feeder, puzzle feeders for them. You can make them uh, for smaller dogs or cats. And people, you know, even like a muffin tin where you put some of their kibble and put tennis balls and they have to figure out uh, which ones to get. I think, you know, keeping it somewhat controlled, but getting them out maybe to sniff, walk a different street where there's new smells that you take in, you know, those kinds of things. Um, again, just different ways. And, and providing them the ability to come out and, and be social like they used to be, even if they can't walk as far anymore. So there is a drug that is uh, FDA approved to treat, uh, to help manage this in dogs, um, not so much in cats, but uh, it, it does seem to help many, not all of them. It works better if you get it before they're too far gone. Uh, usually takes several months uh, to kind of kick in. We don't know how it works, but it does seem to help. Uh, the thing with it though, the studies show that it works best with the mental stimulation. We can't just give them a pill and it works. You've got to keep them puzzle solving and doing crossword puzzles. And all <laughs> If they're really anxious, then you know, and they're not resting, and they're keeping everybody up at night, or sometimes we will use anti-anxiety medications, and then these pheromone therapies, feel away, um, dog appeasing pheromone, those are certainly not going to hurt anything. It might help. Uh, these are synthetic versions of pheromones that dogs, and cats release, that tend to have a calming effect on them. Soliquin and alphenine derivative, and green tea has a tend to have a calming effect. I think massage, go back to that again, would be helpful. Um, Hills has a diet called PD, which is like loaded with antioxidants and, and uh, free radical scavengers. And one time I was at a conference, I was talking to Rep, she goes, I want to start eating this myself. <laughs> it was actually studied in people, the ingredients were studied in people with early dementia. Um, but I think the bottom point is, is they have to have that environmental stimulation and enrichment. We took a dog once with a younger dog who was just not very well behaved as an adopted dog, but it was easier to take them both to school, and she did so much better. Like, she was already very well trained at the start, but she was, we couldn't tell if she was getting lazy or forgetful, but once she went back to, like, some positive, yeah. simple training. Yeah, it really makes a really big difference. So we're kind of, you know, winding down to everything none of us want to have to face or deal with, but, um, it's an elusive concept, you know, what is this quality of life thing? And nobody has uh, an answer that's gonna be true in every situation. Uh, they have developed a lot of different scales to try to, you know, more subjectively, or more objectively assess quality of life. Um, this HHHM scale that really assesses, you kind of look at, are they hurt, are they hungry, um, are they still eating? Are they able to maintain hydration? Or are we able to help them with that? Or are they happy? You know, are they engaged in doing things that made them happy? They may not be able to go chase a tennis ball anymore, but do they still have a, are they still interacting and seem content? Um, can they get up and move themselves around? Are they still mobile? And count these good days versus bad days. I think that's a really easy thing to do, even if you just make a little hatch mark. And when you see those bad days, beginning to outnumber the good things for them, then, you know, I think it's time that we need to have the conversations about, um, you know, peacefully letting them pass on. There's other, you know, you never want to have to make a decision about, like, life and death based on other than what's best for the pet, but the reality of it is that that often comes into play. Um, can you physically lift this 100 50 pound, you know, mask if you get it outside, you know, get it down the stairs, provide that care, you know, work schedules, time commitments, um, and, you know, financially, it can become quite costly, and it just, it, it, it's really emotionally devastating to have to make those decisions based on other than what's best for the pet, and if you're talking about money, things like that, and, work schedule, but that's the reality of it. Um, 
the, this hospice idea and concept was started uh, several years ago by Dr. Um, C. Lobos, who's an internal medicine specialist in California, I think. And it's modeled after the human hospice movement. Um, it's really taken um, a look at these end stage life and animals, a, a whole new way to look at it. And it's really a supportive approach and a team approach with you as a pet parent and the, and the pet and the veterinary healthcare team, you know, coming up and trying to decide what is the best decision to make. Um, the pet care giver support groups, I think, are fabulous, and we know that it's, we know the loss um, that we feel when we lose a pet. Uh, that has been shown in studies. It's just what we're feeling when we lose a family member. And I could have retired. 20 years ago, if I had a dime for every time people said this, it didn't hurt this much when my parent died. Mm -hmm. um, it's very real. You have mm -hmm. to know that it's very real. Um, these animals take on the role of children a lot of times in the household, and it can be devastating. Uh, day by Day is a relatively local group that does a really good job of just, you know, kind of helping, not just pet pets that are passing or passed, but People that are caregiving a diabetic cat or a kidney failure cat, you know, it can be wearing just like caring for a, a family member that's got chronic disease. You can't go on vacation. You can't. You can't find somebody to wash the cat that can give it fluids. You know, so you know, they, they're very good in that kind of support. The Metropolitan has um, that Associates has a bereavement group that meets as does Penn. I think, I hope my hope veterinary referral. Mm -hmm. Rx Remedy. Mm -hmm. 
who will, you know, uh, mix yeah. her medication. Flavor, so yeah. Yep. Yeah, and so Get that's the work. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. I, I found, we found liverwurst. Liverwurst works. I wrap like pills in, uh, in liverwurst and yeah. Yeah. absolutely yeah. love it. Trader yeah. Joe's has a bacon flavored liver, yeah. bacon liverwurst that. Yeah. You're talking about diets. Mm -hmm. A year and a half ago, she stopped all dog food, so we went to a rotisserie chicken. We're now oh, yeah. on liver. For the diets, because I know the normal dog foods have the um, enhancements and the vitamins yeah. and yeah. all. We've tried to give her supplements, but no. so the the best thing if you're going to do it, I, you know, I'm not opposed to it. In fact, I think the best diet any of us could eat is a, a home cooked, balanced, organic diet. So. But it's really hard to do that for us, and it's very hard to do that. Um, so if we're feeding long-term uh, home-cooked diets, mm -hmm. then I usually will recommend have a vet nutritionist. These are veterinarians that have gone beyond veterinary school that are boarded in nutritional medicine, and they can very easily balance out a diet for you mm -hmm. with the minerals, you know, mm -hmm. and they can fine-tune it if it's got kidney disease or if it's got liver disease or we wanted to lose weight. So, and your vet can uh, get you in touch with her. They're at um, she's good. She's yeah. 41. So you just would want a maintenance diet that, uh, you know, it's going to be more balanced than, you know, like what my dog is eating right now. So. Pure protein. That's all she eats. Yeah. A yeah. kale shake in the morning. Yeah. 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 Some little pasta. And little, <laughs> little, little, yeah. It's for the carbohydrate. Because they do need the fats, you know, and the carbohydrate. Right. They do need that ratio. Dogs are, are uh, like us. They're on their Carnivores, so they really were are kind of designed to eat a variety of things, unlike cats who are like obviously protein eaters. Yeah, that, that's the surprising thing with this dog. She is always, since we've had her, she's a rescue, has been very finicky. Where mm -hmm. um, her brother has to say, I side also, and you put anything in front of that dog mm -hmm. and it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> and this one will look and just walk away. Yeah, I know. Have you seen that with the kids? I mean, it's the same yeah, thing. You can have yeah. twins, and they're right. it's so often like that. We yeah. have we have some that are voracious mm -hmm. eaters, and I have others. Yeah, you know, yeah. take it or leave it. They take a special owner. They're they're a special owner. Seven. Well, I had seven. Oh, We're down to six now. Yeah, mm. they are. Yeah, they're interesting. Yeah, it's funny. We also have a cat, and the dog knew the packing order in the house. It was me. The cat, the dog, then Linda. <laughs> <laughs> that dog could walk all over her. And yeah. that 40 some pound husky was afraid of that 10 pound Maine Coon. Oh, yeah. He was literally afraid of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's all about attitude, not yeah. so much the size. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that cat was saying up to the dog. <laughs> and they train us so well. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, we don't stand a chance. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I have the one 15 year old, I had a litter. And she was whelping in the basement, and every morning I would get up and cook her a hamburger, brown rice, and eggs. <laughs> and then she would just get a regular kibble and when she was nursing. She was nursing seven five. She'd come up out of the basement from the whelping pit and he'd wait, sit there, wait for me to cook her breakfast. <laughs> Neatest thing was that was the puppies got about I guess five six weeks old. She ate like half of the hamburger, and she ate the rest of her rice and. She took the hamburger down. I followed her. I got to see this. Yeah. She yeah. set it in the whelping men and she's yeah. no nuzzling them over. And I'm like, I, I don't, you know, just the instinct of getting oh. them on that. Good, cool. I only had one letter. It was I, I couldn't. She when we sold them, I'm, I had to stay at work because I was like, I don't oh, want some. And I would have kept all seven of them. <laughs> yeah, I used to. there's an interesting book called um, The Inside of a Dog, and it's uh, by a, a researcher named Deborah Horowitz and. She goes through all the different scent of, of the dog, the eyes, the, the ears. You spend a lot of time on the sense of smell because that's really where they are wired. And it will blow your mind. Like you know, you always know dogs smell well, but it's it's amazing. I think she's since written one just about the smell. But, um, what's it called? It's, it's, the the one is called Inside of the Inside of the Dog. Okay, I'm Which looking for seen. something new to read. Yeah, and Deborah Horowitz. <laughs> Currently. And, um, she does have another one out, I think just on the sense of smell, but I haven't read that one. Yeah. So. Have, have you ever um, 
use uh, animal communication to, to see what was going on with, the, with animals and everything? I did, you know, a friend of mine had a cat that, um, that they were like, this lady's amazing, she's amazing, and she, uh, the, the one cat was kind of heavy, and I don't think the woman knew this, she was doing this over the phone, and she, Mookie or something, I think it was his name, and she told them that Mookie was comfortable with its body image, <laughs> and that it hated the cat outside, and that was something else she didn't tell them, that, um, that there was this cat that would show up in the neighborhood, and this cat would just go ballistic every time it saw it. Um, so I I don't know, you know, I, I'm i open to whatever. Yeah. And really, but she had you know. she talked to one when we were looking for the dog, or, and and a one dog, or then she had the radio on out in the kennel, and she said, well, he doesn't like the radio on. Wow. Yeah, and and she, the woman had <laughs> how would she know? She was in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She said, what's up with the radio in the in the dog kennel? <laughs> he doesn't like the music. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry to cut things off, but we're closing in a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again.